Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. Remember, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we dig deep into the system that makes bad policing possible. Now, part of that task involves what we call process journalism. That is, following the paper trail and searching out unreported facts to provide a more substantive perspective on law enforcement strategy. It's something we try to do on this show regularly, partly because so many of the tools police use and the tactics they deploy demand more scrutiny not less. And it's also important to know how these same strategies and tactics evolved and how they've been justified in the first place. Remember, we have the most lethal and the most militarized law enforcement in any democracy on the face of the earth. The police departments we cover on this show are often the best funded agencies in the towns and cities where they operate. And generally speaking, cops receive better pensions, health benefits, and perks than the people they purport to serve. Just consider the $75 billion stashed away for police pensions in big city departments we revealed in a previous show earlier this year, which is why we're gonna dig deeper into a newly emerging trend in policing that has stoked controversy, but has not been fully explained or understood. I'm talking about the use of a drug called ketamine during arrests. It's a new tool in the law enforcement toolbox that we covered last month and has come under renewed scrutiny. We have obtained new information about the former animal tranquilizer that has become a common so-called chemical restraint, and also because it has played a role in the death of 26-year-old Elijah McLean, a high-profile case that has continued to raise questions about why ketamine is still in use. As you might recall, in September 2019, police in Aurora, Colorado, administered ketamine to Elijah McLean, a 26-year-old musician who was confronted by cops as he walked home. McLean was never accused of a crime. Instead, someone had simply reported that he was behaving oddly. And as you can see in the video here, police took McLean to the ground and later EMTs administered ketamine. McLean later died, a death in part contributed to administering 500 milligrams of the drug, which eventually led to a heart attack. Now, when we first started reporting on this story, we had some questions about ketamine, just how ketamine became part of, for lack of a better term, the use of force police portfolio, not just how it was authorized in the present, but how it came to be used in the first place. I mean, it seemed to us ketamine had appeared out of nowhere. Suddenly, in a state like Colorado, a drug that is only authorized to be used under the supervision of a physician for anesthesia could be administered to a suspect under the advice of police officers. This seemed to be to us a critical question worth asking. How did ketamine become part of police's use of force portfolio? And thanks to some digging by one of our viewers, we've started to answer these questions, albeit with some disturbing discoveries. As you can see on your screen now, the documents obtained by Colorado resident Frank Sturgill as a result of the Freedom of Information request to the Colorado Department of Health reveals a startling fact. Take a look at this document here. It's what's known as a waiver. It's required by law to allow EMTs to administer ketamine to people without the supervision of a doctor. Let me emphasize this. A powerful anesthetic that often requires lung intubation when administered is being injected without a doctor's diagnosis or knowing what other chemicals might be in a person's system. But what's also interesting about this blanket waiver that has been authorized for all EMTs in Colorado is the condition it's intended to treat, excited delirium, something we have also covered on the Police Accountability Report before. For a primer on excited delirium, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. So can you talk a little bit about the history of excited delirium and why its use as a cause of death is controversial? Uh, when I was a reporter first covering a series of taser deaths here in Maryland, um, I noticed when I was reviewing the autopsies of the people who died in police custody that they often cited excited delirium. So I went to the state medical examiner and said, what the hell is excited delirium? And he gave me this book. And what it said was that it was a 19th century condition that occurred in sanatoriums. But there was really, once I read the book, I realized it was entirely, as far as I could tell, in medical fiction. When I dug deeper with other medical examiners, said, oh yeah, people aren't dying from excited delirium. It's usually cardiac arrhythmia. They just use that to kind of make it up. So really, as far as we know, and as far as we can tell, there's no scientific basis for this idea. So Stephen, you reviewed the documents and you spoke to the viewer who obtained them. What have you learned? Well, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that they 
uh, state of Colorado is very, very reluctant to give up these waivers because the waivers basically show that how broad they are and how there's really no medical prescription that really matches, you know, a condition. So let's listen to Mr. Sturgill, as I interviewed him before, talk a little bit about it. Giving these waivers to medical directors with absolutely no supervision of what's going on. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that I found out from the, um, there's no train, you know, these medical directors are supposed to give training. There's almost no training whatsoever. There's very little, it, it, you know, so, some departments have none, um, some have very little. And um, in fact, Denver actually has a different protocol that doesn't even consider um, all the all the elements of what excited, excited delirium is supposed to be. They even hide that. So just calling it agitation, and Denver is the Denver is the biggest uh, um, injector of ketamine outside of a hospital. So as you can see, you know he's been very persistent because people just don't want to give this information. But I think that's very relevant. Why won't they be transparent about the use of a very dangerous drug? Now Hennepin County is the home of Minneapolis, where George Floyd was murdered by police. What can you tell us about the link between Hennepin County and the use of ketamine? Well, as we know, there was a uh, an EMT in Minneapolis who had, had filed a lawsuit saying, I do not want to administer ketamine anymore. But what's also interesting in the documents that Mr. Sturgill acquired shows that there is some correspondence between Colorado looking for guidance from Hennepin County. So that gives us some sense of the origin. It's something we're going to keep digging into to see if really this started in all places. Minneapolis, which right now doesn't have the best reputation for policing at all. So. We have a dangerous drug widely authorized to treat a questionable, perhaps even fabricated medical condition. In fact, the American Association of Anesthesiologists has stated publicly ketamine should not be authorized for use in field settings. And they should know, since technically the only approved use for ketamine is to anesthetize patients prior to surgery. Then we have a medical doctor endorsing the diagnosis of a condition, excited delirium, which, as Stephen points out, has questionable scientific provenance and, in fact, has been used in the past to explain the deaths involving another controversial use of force tool, the taser. But to truly understand the impact of this policy, we're going to talk to someone who has actually been given ketamine during an arrest. His name is Jeremiah Axtell, and he's the boyfriend of Colorado Councilwoman Anita Springsteen. As you may recall, Councilwoman Springsteen told us about the pushback she received from the police and fellow council members after she questioned the use of ketamine during arrest. Her concern was prompted by this. The arrest of Jeremiah after he got into a dispute with an assisted living health facility adjacent to their home. As you can see on this video, he was restrained and was cooperating when EMTs administered the drug. But now he's joining us to discuss how this drug has affected him and the lingering repercussions that are just beginning to come to light for him. Jeremiah, thank you for joining us. So first, what was it like to be injected with ketamine? How did it feel? Sure, I didn't know what was going on around me, what was going on inside of me, if I was going to come out of it. So did it cause memory loss? I believe I was affected in a lot of ways, including mentally. I think my process of thinking has been different. I know, I know there's going to be certain distrust with the law that was initially there, but I mean, as far as the chemical in my mind, a lot of words that I want to say I don't remember in the middle of the sentence when I want to use them and I, I didn't have that problem before. My my moods are different, controlling them is different and, and become a chore sometimes. Were you read your Miranda rights or do you even remember getting Miranda? I know for a fact I was not. They marked it on the rest ticket that it was non-applicable. Miranda informed or whatever it says yes, no or or non-applicable and they checked non-applicable. I was never arrested. They never told me I was under arrest. Has being injected with ketamine and your experience with police had any long-term consequences? And since then, my life has just totally been destroyed. The local media shared this video of what led to your arrest, and law enforcement alleged that you were menacing your neighborhood living center. But five out of those seven charges against you were dropped. What began this conflict? What part of the story did mainstream media miss? Well, I can't say too much about that quite yet. I know that one in particular channel misrepresented what really happened, I believe, on purpose. The police not necessarily using their best abilities on the streets and maybe turning to these easier trolls. 
because of that. And well, in addition to per personal feelings coming out, like they know what they can do and they basically they just abuse they abuse their tools. Councilwoman Springsteen, can you give us an update on your investigation into ketamine? People don't realize how insidious this is because if there are other alternative drugs that don't cause respiratory distress, uh, this pharmacist I work with pulled off a list of complications with uh, ketamine of contraindicated drugs. It's three pages long, but there's other drugs that are not like that. Why are they using ketamine? So we've been digging into why are those kinds of drugs being chosen? And one of the things we've come to uh, is that we think that those kind of drugs cause memory ablation. And so that suits law enforcement's needs as well, because you have, you know, a citizen who is being arrested and suddenly has been sedated and doesn't remember what happened in the moments leading up to that is open to suggestion. And so, you know, if anyone has ever experienced being drunk and not remembering what happened, and then somebody says, oh, you did so-and-so, you're not in a position to um, deny that because you don't remember. Now, you might be asking Taya, why is it so important to drill down into the use of drugs that are, let's say, sometimes less than lethal? Why should we get into the weeds about a chemical restraint in a country where cops actually shoot and kill roughly 1,000 people a year? Well, consider our show last week. In it, we told the story of Trinity Fleming, a 19-year-old girl who was mauled by a police dog after an alleged high-speed chase with police in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, just a warning, the images you are about to see are disturbing. The dog detached part of her ear, punctured her skull, and caused so much bruising and swelling she couldn't see, and ultimately left her needing reconstructive surgeries and potentially scarred for life. Shortly after we contacted Fort Wayne, Indiana police about why this happened, we received this email revealing that Trinity's case was just one of five incidents that resulted in injury out of nearly 1,000 cases a year when a dog is used by Fort Wayne police. But this email only raised more questions for us. Question we posed in a follow-up email you can see now. We wanted to know, what is the criteria for commanding a dog to use deadly force? What are the circumstances when it is justified? Do the officers involved have to file use of force reports? And finally, what were the circumstances of the other 1,000 incidents that year that involved dogs? When were they used and why? These were critical questions that we felt deserved answers, especially in light of what happened to Trinity. And how did the Fort Wayne Police Department respond? with silence. That's right, the taxpayer-funded government institution deploying and using near lethal force against its citizenry will not answer basic fundamental questions about how and why that force is used. Even after a dog attack left a 19-year-old girl permanently disfigured, they couldn't take the time to respond to inquiries seeking basic information. And that's the point. That's why the questions regarding ketamine are so important. We already know the drug can be lethal, as the Elijah McClain case makes clear. And after our interview with Jeremiah, we know the drug has lasting impact on the people who are forced to take it, which is why these questions have to be answered. Think about it. What other government institution could deploy lethal tactics, questionable medical interventions, and even use drugs against the advice of doctors and not answer critical questions about how and why they're doing it. Whether their agency could literally have the right to take a life, but also claim the privilege of not having to explain themselves when they do it. Sometimes I think we fail to recognize the exceptionally broad powers we bestow upon cops and law enforcement. We simply accept as routine the notion a single individual officer can choose when he or she is fearful to subdue or even kill another human being. It's an extraordinary license we extend to millions of people across this country, which, as we know by now, often leads to tragic results. Well, you might ask, why should I care about police using chemical restraints in Colorado? 
because police departments share practices. For example, the use of tasers as less than lethal force began in the 1990s. And now in 2020, almost half a million patrol officers carry tasers. And if initiating ketamine injections is considered a reasonable and effective law enforcement tool by Colorado's police departments, ketamine use or forced sedation could spread to and be initiated by your local police next. That is why we need to ask tough questions about ketamine, why we must continue to demand explanations for the use of the drug to cure an imagined illness like excited delirium, and why this drug has been used over 900 times in Colorado over the past two and a half years, despite the fact that doctors have urged police to stop. These questions have to be asked and answered, if not only to prevent further tragedies, but to let police know that contriving a use for a controversial and dangerous drug under the auspices of a questionable science will not occur under the cover of darkness. We will continue to shed light on what they don't want us to see, the truth. I wanna thank Frank Sturgill for his research and for speaking with us today. Thank you, Frank. And I want to thank Councilwoman Springsteen and Jeremiah Axtell for speaking out and sharing their experience with us. So stay safe and healthy. And of course, I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his reporting, writing, and editing on this piece. Taya, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I have to thank friend of the show, Noli D, for his support. Thanks, Noli D. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at parattherealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter and Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read the comments and appreciate them. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.